Good morning. Welcome. We're glad you're here. We have a great topic, having a place called home. And uh, I just have found this to be a very exciting topic, one that I hope you'll be blessed by. So let's have a word, word of prayer. Father, we need heaven. We need a longing for heaven. We need to have a hope for heaven. And I pray that you'll just bless our study and, uh, and fill us during this time of stress, anxiety, and a world that's broken. May we have that deep hope in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we appear to be suffering a great crisis of hope. COVID has taken its toll. It's caused fear, it's caused worry, caused pain, sorrow. The, we see the pictures of the exhausted medical workers. We hear the cries of those who have lost loved ones, and we need hope. We hear the death toll rising every day that keep climbing, 160,000 deaths in America, and deaths are growing around the world. Not only is there death from COVID, but 820 million people are suffering from hunger. The new UN report reveals stubborn realities of immense global challenges, starvation, and, well, Africa's biggest refugee camps are spread out across Africa. In Kenya, one camp is 250,000 people of displaced people in a refugee camp. Another one is 184,550. Uh, Tanzania, 150,000 of refugees. Can you imagine these people are without home, living in a small shack or a tent, and it's growing. There's a great crisis. We need hope. Hunger due to COVID-19 killing 10,000 children per month, UN says. What is going on in our broken world? Life is brutal, and to be honest, it's just too much to bear. We can't think about it. If we do think about it, depression, leading cause of disability worldwide. What is going on in our broken world? It tears our hearts to listen to the news and to hear the statistics keep growing and growing of tragedy and, and pain and sorrow and, 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 and the hurting world around us. But in the midst of the brokenness, there's a promise. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, John, write it down, write, for these words are true and faithful. As if God didn't want these words to be lost, he wanted them written down for every generation to know that there's something better to come. There's more. All things will be new. This broken world is not all there is. Now, a lot of people don't get excited about heaven because they think of it as just floating on a cloud forever perhaps playing a harp, just drifting along, and nirvana somewhere out there in space. Some people say heaven is a state of mind. It's inner peace. It's a state of calm. They think this heaven is in between their ears and it's just a state of peace. That's not the heaven that God has promised. Heaven is my house. You should see it. It's worth three million. My chariot is my Lexus. The angels are my kids. Well, that's nice to have good kids and to maybe have some wealth, but that's not heaven that God has promised. Heaven? Man, that's pie in the sky, out there somewhere. Unreal, man. I can't fathom it. It's out there. Now, that's just hopeful wishing. Heaven is, are you so out of touch you still believe in those fairy tales? Now, that's the new atheism, that there is no God, no heaven, no hell. And then Deepak Chopra says, heaven is a real, as real as spirit, and spirit is the only reality because this spirit is within us all along. This is kind of a new age that heaven is within our hearts. It is possible to create a heaven on earth simply by turning within and becoming aware of our inner selves. It's just inside of us. We create our own heaven. We create our own hell. Back in 1999, Pope John Paul II says, The heaven in which we will find ourselves is neither an abstraction nor a physical place among the clouds. 
The 79-year-old pontiff declared to a crowd of pilgrims assembled at St. Peter's Square in the Vatican, you know, he, he said it's not a real place. And he went on, the Pope declared heaven and hell is a non-physical place, which means whatever it is, it's just out there someplace, hard to describe, and it just doesn't seem to inspire us with hope. And I believe we need to have a renewal of hope an ache in our hearts for something better, something real, and God has promised a real home, a real place, with real peace, with a real Savior. And we need an unshakable, unbreakable, unquenchable hope, hope of heaven, hope of a better world, hope that this is not all there is. The Bible says, looking for the blessed hope, and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the, the real, ultimate hope of Christ's return. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a, a living hope. This is a, a living hope that can burn within our hearts that there is more beyond it's an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. The future hope, something more. This is not all there is. We cannot spend all our time and energy just for this planet and the stuff of this world. Heaven, exit now. Let's prepare for heaven now. Make a commitment that you'll be in heaven now. If you miss heaven, you've missed everything that is worth living for. Want to be beautiful to see this sign? Welcome to heaven. Heaven is coming. It's coming soon. Therefore, Peter says, gird up the loins of your mind. Let's bring our thinking into harmony with God. Be sober. Let's, be, let's face reality. And rest your hope fully, set your hope fully upon the grace, the wonderful grace of a renewed earth, a renewed heaven, a renewed kingdom that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ when Christ comes and everything will be renewed. Rest your hope fully upon that precious promise that what Jesus has said will come and will happen. It will not be long till we shall see him in whom our hopes of eternal life are centered. And in his presence, all the trials and suffering of this life will be as nothingness. From the book Heaven by Ellen White, page 190. Jesus gave us that promise. In my Father's house, God's kingdom, are many mansions or many rooms. There's space for you. There's space for... This is what we've longed for. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place. God knows that there's an ache in our hearts for Eden. We don't fit in this broken planet. It hurts. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. He's promised it. We can count on it. It's the hope that burns within our hearts, or it can burn within our hearts, and it should burn within our hearts, that there's more ahead. And I will receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. Jesus has said, I'm coming again to take you home to paradise, the new Jerusalem. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing and design, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. What a beautiful day that will be. Do you believe it? Do you hope? Do you have that longing in your heart? Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. This is not going to be, this world will not be the way it's, it has always been broken. Some rich, some poor, some starving, some hurting, some in deep pain and, 
and uh, living in shanties and shacks and mud huts. No, God has made a wonderful world, a beautiful world, and it's for you, and it's for me, and it's for us who celebrate Christ and his love. When will we go? Well, this is the great hope of the believer. We know that Jesus is promised, and Paul says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. That's the great second coming, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. This is the great ultimate victory that God has given us to look forward to. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Always, always for eternity. What a hope we have. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. Jesus has promised it. It's been written down as a promise and we can count on it. How will our bodies be different? Well, Paul says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. A glorious body, whole, healthy, full, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. God's power will change these broken, lowly bodies and make them like his glorious body. Still physical, still being able to see, hear, taste, touch, feel, and yet it's going to be a glorious body like Jesus when he was raised from the dead. The Bible says, And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall with vitality and vibrancy and happiness. We will grow with, have energy. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing, shout for joy. Those who you know, have been wounded by the sin of this earth will be set free, and those who have never been able to see will just be absorbing all the sights and those who have not been able to hear will just drink in all the sounds of the birds and, the, and the, the singing, and they'll just revel in what God has created. What a beautiful hope we have. No more walkers, wheelchairs, eyeglasses, cane, walking canes, dentures, hearing aids, all gone free from all the aids that we have on this earth. We can't hardly imagine it, what it will be like to have whole, healthy bodies. And the inhabitant will not say, I am sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquities. There's going to be complete healing, complete wholeness, complete happiness. You kissed my heart with forgiveness. In spite of all I've done, you healed me inside and out from every disease. What a beautiful promise of complete restoration because of the redemption of Christ. Psalms 103, he renews your youth. You're always young in his presence. To have that renewed, youthful vibrancy again and that energy, what a beautiful promise we can have and can count on that we have to look forward to. It's a breathtaking promise. For this corruptible, this rust bucket of broken body that can ache and hurt and have pain and sorrow and depression and loneliness must put on incorruption, a body of vitality and energy and strength and wholeness and happiness. And this mortal, subject to death, must put on immortality, no more dying, no more decay, and no more death. We can't hardly imagine it, but that's the hope, the promise that God has given to us to live with that hope of a better world, a better land, a better future. There were giants on the earth in those days. Yes, we're going to grow up. We're going to get taller. We're going to get bigger and stronger. And so the Bible reminded us that, yes, one day back in the early uh, ages of this world, there were giants, they were bigger, they were stronger. 
And so we see tucked away in the Bible this great promise. Where will we live? Ah, think of this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Someday God's going to bring a healthy, whole city back to this earth. Coming down, it was in heaven and it's coming down to this earth. And this beautiful city has that river of life flowing out of it. And the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. There's 12 different layers of foundations to hold the city. And all different colors of special gems and jewels of our, are, are underneath the city. You can just think of the red and the blue and the, the mauve and the green and the reds and the yellows, all these beautiful colors, these gems that sparkle. Now use your imagination with me. This is why God has given these promises in his word to, 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 to thrill our hearts. And the Bible says that the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it the Lamb is its light. There shall be no night there. Jesus, glorious beauty of light shining out through this city with foundations of gems and jewels and radiant colors. And you can just imagine the water of life flowing over these foundations, flowing down layer after layer, and the light of Jesus flowing out of the city creates these rainbows of dazzling color, of beauty and glory, a light show like you've never seen. It thrills our hearts. We love beauty. Beauty heals. Beauty is sacred. And we long for beauty. We've been looking for beauty. We've lost Eden. And we long to go back to a home where beauty is there everywhere. No decay. Nothing ugly. Nothing that's corrupt. And so we long for a city to call home. And Jesus will be there. He'll walk with us and talk with us. Language is altogether too feeble to attempt a description of heaven. As the scene rises before me, I am, all, I am lost in amazement, carried away with the surpassing splendor and excellent glory. I lay down the pen and exclaim, Oh, what love, what wondrous love! The most exalted language fails to describe the glory of heaven or the matchless depths of a Savior's love. She can't describe it. Oh, what language can I use to describe this beautiful land? Within the city, there was everything to feast the eye. Rich glory we beheld everywhere. And Jesus said with his rich musical voice, this rich glory is yours to enjoy eternally. Your sorrows are ended. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Welcome home. Welcome to beauty, everlasting beauty. Now the 12 gates were 12 pearls. I don't know. It's just a description of a beautiful gate, a door. Each individual gate was of one pearl, beautiful, translucent pearl. And the streets of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. You know, people treasure gold here. They have a, a gold ring, a gold necklace, something gold is treasured. It's precious. But up in heaven, it's only asphalt. We're going to walk on it. We're going to just going to be pavement up in heaven. The Bible says, now those you have rescued will return to Jerusalem, singing on their way. They will be crowned with great happiness, never again to be burdened with sadness and sorrow. Can you imagine never having a down day again, never being worried or depressed or sad, never being anxious again, never being uh, a little worried or afraid. That's almost unimaginable. What about the tree of life? 
This is the food that fills our hearts and satisfies us. I don't think we know everything about this tree, but it's described in the Bible. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its, of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life. This tree gives life, which it bore 12 fruits. This fruit is healing. This fruit is delicious. Each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. It somehow restores us. It energizes us. Whether we touch it, make a tea, we, we rub it on us, it's a healing. We're going to heal and grow up in heaven. I don't understand all about this tree, but there's something about nature that is healing. Even now we know when people get out in nature, it's healing for their souls. And so what it's like, this wonderful, beautiful tree that hangs over the river, the beauty is, is healing for our hearts, inspiring. It's just a beautiful tree that God creates for us to enjoy, to eat the fruit that satisfies us like we've never been satisfied before and healed like we've never been healed before. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Aren't there some things in your life you just wish you could forget? Take it away, God. I just wish I wouldn't have to think about those memories anymore. Perhaps it was that abuse, that that painful relationship, that painful experience. There are some things that God will take away, take away. Now we'll be able to still tell our testimony. We'll still share the love of God and the redemption and the great profound forgiveness of God in giving His Son. But there are some things that will be removed from our minds and we're going to be healed. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. No more. No more pain. No more sorrow. Now what else are we going to do in heaven? They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Now maybe I know some of you have heard this verse many times. Build, build houses and have a vineyard and eat the fruit. But remember, there's a lot of people, millions and billions of people who live in shanties and shacks and mud huts and just a few, you know, ramshacked leaves and bushes over their head as they sleep. And they get up in the day, they go work in the sulfur mines for 12 or 14 hours. They perhaps work in the salt mines in the heat of 100 degrees trying to make out a living. And they come home to their little shanty and they wish and they long they could do so much more for their family. But in heaven, they'll be able to build a castle that they dreamed about. They'll be able to build a home and provide for their families that upon this earth, they've never been able to do. We don't even realize fully sometimes the pain of those who live in ramshacked countries, working in mines, coal mines and uh, just trying to survive and bring home a little bit of rice, a little bit of flour, a little bit of food for their families. But someday it's going to be radically changed and there's going to be rejoicing and provision to enjoy for every person. <laughs> oh, can you imagine? Those who have lived in a little shanty, a shack, a mud hut, a little, a little you know, home all their lives, just eking out and existing, and they have, finally they have a, a home, a paradise. A fear of making the future inheritance seem too material has led many to spiritualize away the very truths which lead us to look upon it as our home. Christ assured his disciples that he went to prepare mansions for them in the earth's in the Father's house. Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. And no finite mind can comprehend the glory 
of the paradise of God. I mean, we're physical beings. We love beautiful things. And God is, will prepare a, a beautiful home. Just These are just earthly pictures. But can you imagine? Welcome to my house. Come, let's have a dinner and let's celebrate together. Let's feast. And the food will be delicious. No more worms or sprays or germs. It's going to be a feast. Jesus said, then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we're going to celebrate. We're going to eat and, and drink to this great celebration of the victory of Jesus, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Be there. Be there. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. Beauty like we've never imagined. We ache for Eden. We've come a long ways from the garden. We were made for something so much better. This would be home. Beauty, flowers that never die. Gardens to just refresh our hearts, revive our spirits, just to drink it all in. Colors like we've never seen, dazzling, brilliant beauty. We love trips to Hawaii or the Caribbean. But these are only tiny, broken, miniature pictures of that home that God has prepared for us for eternity. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And dust shall be the serpent's food. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. That's all we know here on this earth is hurting and destruction. That blast in Beirut, Lebanon was unbearable. Can you imagine the pain that people went through? No more hurt and destruction in all my holy mountains. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We're going to drink in and know the love of God, and the love of God will be everywhere, washing us over us. All the unselfish, beautiful love of God will be taken in. What a beautiful picture. The lion, our friend. On this earth, we see just little, maybe little glimpses that are inside the heart of these animals that we long to be close to. They are created to be our friends, our pets. Long for love, the love that God put within us to be close and intimate. I begged of my attending angel to let me remain in that place, Ellen White wrote. I could not bear the thought of coming back to this dark world again. She saw a better world. She saw something that was worth having. She tried to describe it. I would encourage you to read the book, Heaven. It's about 190 pages. Read the book. Will we go to church up in heaven? Well, yes. The Bible is pretty clear from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh will come to worship. Why not worship? It's a cycle of life. This God of love, this God of beauty, this God of restoration, this God of wholeness and happiness. We will want to praise Him. We will want to sing glory to Him because He has restored Eden again. We can't even imagine. But we will enjoy worship. Sabbath after Sabbath, we will come together and sing and worship. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. It is beyond our imagination. It's beyond our comprehension. It's beyond what we see upon this world, the best looking picture, the best mansion. It's beyond. It's beyond. 
That's heaven. And it's what you were made for, what you long for, what you desire is what God will fulfill. Beauty beyond description, colors beyond our imagination, fun and pleasures that we never can comprehend. Violence will not be heard again in your land, nor devastation or destruction within your borders, but you will call your wall salvation and your gates praise. Just a glorious home, a treasure that we long for. This is the ultimate hope. This is the great rescue of our hearts. This is what we've been longing for every day of our lives. And Jesus will be there, our best friend, our companion, our savior. Now who will get to enter and enjoy all this? The spirit and the bride say, come, come, come. And let him who, is, who hears say, come. And let him who is thirst come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The invitation is for you and me. Come, let's drink. Let's drink of the well of redemption, of forgiveness, of restoration now upon this earth. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. They do his commandments not to earn salvation, but because their hearts are broken because of what Christ has done for them. But there shall be no means enter it anything that defiles, causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Is your name written there? Have you made a decisive decision to give your life and your heart to Christ? Are you a citizen of that heavenly land? You miss heaven, you've missed everything worth living for. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You want to serve God. You're committed because he loves you. You, you know he has the best plan for your life. He has your eternal happiness. And you're committed because he's been so committed to you. Romans 6, 26, 22 says, But now, having been set free from sin through the washing of the blood of Jesus, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. Just give your life to Christ. Become a slave to him. Say, Lord, You've poured out all heaven for me. I'm going to give all to you. I want to be your son, your daughter. I want to serve you. I want to bear fruit for holy. I want the Holy Spirit living in me. I want to serve you. I may make mistakes, but I'm yours, God. You can have the assurance that heaven is your home. And we must enter heaven here below, or we shall never enter the heaven hereafter. Right here on this earth, we must begin to live the life of Christ and then it will be a heaven to you and it will be a heaven to those who associate with you. Heaven can start right now as we let heaven in our hearts, the love of God shine forth. Heaven can begin on this earth as we serve and help and bless other people. Heaven must begin now. Let's open our hearts and serve people. Let's be unselfish now. Let the love of God fill our hearts now. How does heaven help us live for God now? Heaven can change us now. But in keeping with his promise, the promise of a new heaven and a new earth, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Don't hold on to this world. We're passing through. I like what Blaise Pascal says, we often make nothing of eternity and eternity of nothing. This is dangerous. And he's so right. Let's have a, 
a vision, a focus of a better land. We're passing through, we're strangers and pilgrims. Paul says, for our light affliction, yes, we go through trials, guaranteed, this world is not our home. There will be affliction, which is but for a moment. These 70, 80, 90, 100 years, maybe 101, 102, are just temporary. Their moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. As we pass through those trials, we learn to trust God. We learn to pray. We learn to cry out. We learn to ask God to strengthen us and change us. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, and they're passing away. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Let's remember that there's an eternity way beyond this little tiny speck of a world. God is something so much more. Let's live by faith. Perhaps that's why God told John, write it down. Write it down. We live by faith. It is written. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. Jesus, our Savior, the hope of his coming again. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Someday we're going to receive that crown of life. We're going to hear those words, welcome home. Finally, Paul says, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. A crown is waiting. I can't imagine wearing a crown. It kind of seems kind of strange. On this earth, people strive for gold medals and, well, the Stanley Cup. That's the big one here in Canada. And Queen Elizabeth, well, she has this royal crown she wears occasionally. These are the big things of this earth. This is what glorifies men upon this world. But Ellen White says, you need not talk of the honors of the world or the praise of its great ones. They are all vanity. Let but the finger of God touch them and they would soon go back to dust again. I want honor that is lasting, honor that is immortal, honor that will never perish, a crown that is richer than any crown that ever decked the brow of a monarch. And so God has promised, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. God will reward his children. Be faithful. He's coming. Faith beholds the mansions by faith. The mansions that Jesus has gone to prepare for those who love him. Faith sees the robe and the crown all prepared for the overcomer. Faith hears the song of the redeemed and brings eternal glories near. Faith awakens our imagination. We can contemplate, and God's word is put into, those, into the scripture, the promises of that better land, that better world. And Jesus will then say, then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, come. Welcome home. This is for you. I prepared it for you. Come, you blessed of my Father. And we're going to worship Jesus. We'll gather around and glorify him and praise him and thank him for what he's done for us. Ellen White says, I want you to have heaven. I know of no one who would appreciate heaven more than you. <laughs> Do you long for heaven? Was this written for you? I know of no one who would appreciate heaven more than you. Do you appreciate heaven? Do you have that longing in your heart? Are you preparing for that eternal home? Jesus has made a way. He's the Lamb of God that has taken our sins, paid the price, was nailed to that Roman wood, walked through the suffering for you and me, what a sacrifice is this? Who can fathom it? It will take the whole of eternity 
for man to understand the plan of redemption. It will open to him line upon line, here a little and there a little, a little here and little. It will say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done that I could have this eternal home of paradise that lasts forever and ever and ever and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I'll never fully grasp the love that drove him to Calvary, but it was for you and me, a love that spanned eternity. You were on his heart, his mind, as he was dying there, that you might live forever with him in paradise. He told the thief on the cross, today, I tell you, I give you the promise that you will be with me in paradise. What a promise to die, to knowing that you will go to heaven. Do you have that hope? Do you have that hope that you're going to sing and join the redeemed and be there? I pray and I hope that that will be your decision. The king on the throne will be the lamb that was slain. Then my people will live in a peaceful habitation and in secure dwellings and in undisturbed rest, resting places. That's home, home, a peaceful habitation. On those peaceful, plain, peaceful plains beside those living streams, God's people, so long pilgrims and wanderers, shall find a home. Home, sweet home, never more to roam. This is heaven, a place called home. Will you be there? Jesus invites you. Jesus invites you to walk and follow him. Give your life to him. He can give you eternal life. He wants that eternal life to start now upon this earth as he forgives our sins, cleansing our lives, changing us, and preparing us for heaven. And we can say, Lord, take it away. Take this, this dark attitude, this irritable spirit, this anger, this impatience. Cleanse me, Lord. May I be more like you. Fill my heart with your joy and your peace. I pray that that will be your decision right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the hope of heaven. And I pray that each one here will make a decisive decision, that they will put their affections upon the things of heaven and not upon the things of this world. Thank you for the blood of Christ who can cleanse away every sin and every defilement. Lord, we again just ask that you'll put your robe of righteousness around us, Fill our hearts with that commitment, that longing, that ache. Fill us, Father, with a the knowledge there's a better world to come. And I pray that someday we can all meet around that sea of glass, around the throne of God, and lift and sing our voice in praising, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. We love you, Father. We thank you for your great salvation. Bless each one. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.